Hello, everyone. My name is Julie McVeigh, and this is Unordinary Made Ordinary, where we talk about extraordinary experiences of everyday people. And today we are talking with Kathy McDaniel. Welcome, Kathy, to the program. Thanks, Julie. Happy to be here. I am so thrilled that you are taking this time to share this amazing uh, near-death experience with us. And I was wondering if before we get into your experience, can you just share a little bit about yourself, a little background info, info into who you are? <laughs> <laughs> um, my parents got uh, married out of high school back when World War II started. So my dad was in the Navy and had a, uh, well, a near-death experience himself. Oh. And um, his plane was shot down and he was an atheist and he just uh, was upside down in his plane in the middle of the battlefield. And he said, God, if you can get me out of here, then I'll become a Catholic. And miraculously, some guys ran out of the jungle, lifted the plane up and drug him off into the, into the jungle. So he was our first convert in the family. And then he uh, continued to be in the Navy for 30 years. So my family was kind of uplifted and moved every two and a half to four years, starting in the Midwest, East Coast, West Coast. So I was always the new kid and I had to kind of think on my feet and get pretty good at um, uh, meeting new people and all of that. So I got married young. I was only 19 and my husband 20. Our first baby died when she was only a couple of days old. It was very oh. traumatic. We never quite recovered from that. We, even though we had two more children and were married for 10 years, we did eventually break up. So I was a single mom. I eventually got into property management. I met a wonderful man that became my fiance, my mentor, and he encouraged me to start my own business, which I did. And I had that for about 10 years. And um, so that's the background here. Wow, lovely. Thank you so much for that introduction. I appreciate that. Um, gives a little bit more you know context into who you are I, I love that um okay so if i also have another if it's okay one other question before we get started i'm just curious if before your your experience which i think you said um had said it was in 1999 when i had was your near-death experience yeah is that it was correct? right at the very end right around new year's eve actually were, had you been, so you said you grew, did you grow up Catholic then? You had a religious background? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. All Catholic schools uh, my okay. whole life. Okay. Just wanted to verify that. Um, okay. I am so interested to hear your story in your own words, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of starting from the beginning, maybe, of how that well, happened. And... March of 1999, my um, fiance, we had broken up and stayed good friends because he got transferred to the East Coast. He got leukemia, called me and asked if I'd be a caregiver for him. He was going to go to Seattle to a research hospital because his doctors gave up. He was only 53. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I said, sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. I said, I'd go. He says, yeah, it'll probably be three to five months. So uh, another caregiver went. So the three of us were there. And it was, uh, he'd be great for a couple of days, then he'd be terrible, then he'd be at de death's door, then he'd be better. And it was a lot of tr uh, trauma. He'd wake up in the middle of the night, his nose was bleeding. We'd have to get him in the car, take him to the hospital. It was a lot of trauma. I didn't sleep much. Mm -hmm. Then she broke her foot. I had to take care of both of them then. So he oh. finally passed away. He was, you know, uh, a week before his 54th birthday. And I oh. was devastated because... I just, I couldn't understand how that could happen to him. Mm -hmm. And so I was physically a wreck, emotionally a wreck, and spiritually a little miffed but about the whole thing. And so I got the flu, very similar to what's going around now. I got pneumonia, and then they had to put me into a drug-induced coma because I went into ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome. Right. Uh, also called complications of pneumonia, but it's lung failure. So my family was all there. They came from California and back east and all that other stuff to be with me. And the last thing the doctor said is, uh, we're going to put you in this coma. You're just going to go to sleep. 
You're not going to remember a thing. We're going to give you something called white amnesia. And we don't okay. want you pulling your tubes out and all that stuff, but you will be comfortable. And it's wow. just dark. No problem. My dad gives me the thumbs up, you know, my, they are, I'm waving goodbye to everybody. And I went to sleep. Wow. Well, <clears throat> he was wrong. I woke up in this dark room. I guess it was a room. It was completely dark. I had no idea where I was. There was no sound. And I was afraid to move because I didn't know if I was standing on something or sitting. I had no idea. So I just waited. And then the, the scene kind of started to shift a little bit. It started to get a little lighter. And I thought, oh, OK, OK, good. Except it was kind of this reddish kind of glow. And then as it got lighter, it was swirling fog. And I thought, huh, and it started getting warm and it smelled stinky. And okay. uh, I started hearing <clears throat> moans and shrieks coming out of the darkness. And I thought, wow, this can't be good. You know, I, I imagine yourself in that situation. And um, all of a sudden, this, this horrible voice boomed out of the darkness and it said, do you know where you are? And I, I'm, I'm thinking, 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 and all I could come up with was hell. And he just laughed, this horrible, booming laugh. Well, that's, I thought, oh my, I got to get out of here. So I just turned and ran into the darkness. I didn't care if I fell in a hole or not. I, I had to get away from that thing. So that began a series of, all I can say is it's like movie sets, scenes, except they were real. The first one, um, when it became light again, I kind of stopped because I, I looked around and it was it was it was like being in New York City after somebody dropped a bomb, a huge oh, bomb. Oh. I've had another guy. I heard his story. His started like that too. Yes. Um, yeah. With and, and it concrete had fallen over, rebar sticking out of there, fires over here, all those windows blown out. And again, I'm just. Boom, I'm in this situation and I thought, uh, I gotta hide. I, you know, I mean, this is not, I can't be standing out here in the middle. So I found this spot that two pieces of huge pieces of concrete had had fallen. So I kind of wedged myself in there. I, I felt like my heart was beating. I was panicked and I thought, well, now what, you know? And um, as I was looking around, my eyes kind of got used to it and I could see over in a, in, in a pile of stuff. So it looked like somebody hiding like me. And I thought, oh, thank God, I'm not the only one that's still alive, you know? So I called out and I, you know, hello, hello, you know, hey, you know, maybe we should get together. Maybe mm -hmm. we can do better as a couple. And, and um, he, he just, this, this mo moaning kind of voice came back. We are all alone here. I thought that's not good. That's not good at all. And so other weird things started happening. It's great detail in the book. This felt like about two years for me when I got back and really thought about how long. Wow, really? There's no, you know, you know, there's no time there. It's always this eternal now thing. Wow. But, but That's it was a long time to feel. It was a long time. It well, was, do, I mean, do you, I, so let's hold our place, but yeah. um, do you remember during that time, did you remember, oh, wait, I was in a coma and now I'm here? You know, I've crossed over. I'm in like the hell or of the other no, side. No, I was just alive. I had okay. no idea. You're just thrown into dead. the situation alive. I, it was like a, <laughs> yeah. somebody's bad joke. You know, like oh, let's let's scare the heck out of Kathy. Let's throw her in this situation. And you had not you had not remembered you were in the hospital or anything that you had nothing. Okay, nothing. Did you remember just, Kathy's life? No, I was just huh. me. You, did you remember like, that your mom and you had kids? Oh, no, no, no. All I was okay. focused on was Present. staying alive. Okay. <laughs> Stay, you know, staying alive in this place. Well, were you physical I, then? You had hands and you could feel yeah. things. Can you yeah. feel pain? I didn't have a, yes. Like a physical pain? Oh, you could. And okay. there's an explanation for that too. Um, I mean, you, we, as you know, we're all, our, our soul is us, our personality, that the body is just this, this vehicle we drive around in like a car. So when you get out of the car, you're still you. And that's exactly how I felt. I didn't feel any different at all. I just felt like 
I'd fallen down, you know, like Alice in Wonderland. I, I, I really did. All I knew is I had to stay alive. I knew I would get out of there if I could find a door, if I could find somebody that, that could point the way. I, I was determined. I'm not going to stay here. I'm going to get out. So that, so that was just what I was doing. And, um, but here it is, you know, 22 years later, and I still remember every single thing that happened. So that doctor who said I wouldn't remember anything, wow. you know, in my brain, I didn't remember anything, but in my soul, it's, it's all. It's still, so for two years, you're there. going from one scene to another it scene like. of kind of miserable conditions, trying to figure out how do I get one, out of here? Yeah. And one was worse than the next, you know, and, um, the first one was in this place. And when I, there was creatures, all of a sudden I'm thinking, uh oh, now there's like giant spiders out there. I can hear them scuttling and I could just see oh. one kind of go by fast. I hate spiders. No, That's no. like my number one thing. Oh my. And, and big ones. And, and, uh, uh, and then there was like this group of dead people that, that came out of the, they had to be dead. They, they kind of, came and they wanted to see if I was going to help or whatever. They didn't really say much. They were kind of floating together. Uh, I don't know. It was, it was not a good place. So I tried to run away. I tried to get over this great big concrete thing. I thought, well, if I, maybe if I get on the other side, you know, but I fell. And as I did, these things kind of started closing in on me and I just closed my eyes. And when I would do that, I'd open them and I'd be somewhere else. And the second one okay. was weird in that it was like a movie set and I got on this movie set, but there was someone there that I knew that was alive. So again, this was throwing me. Uh, what is, you know, I, she was there and, and she had her two friends. I knew them. And, and it was this weird thing where she was a person that I was very close to, but she was, had no real religious or spiritual side to her. It was all about looking, looking good. If you okay. look good on the outside, that was what was important. And you only hung out with people that, you know, were looked good. So she, I walked up to her and she said, oh, you look like hell. And I, you know, again, I didn't, when I got back, I found the humor in that. But then I just thought that was something she would ordinarily say. She says, get up here. It was like a beauty parlor thing. I thought, wow. Uh, yeah. You know, and so, but everything was canted. It was like, like in the twilight zone, if you were in one of those episodes or something. Mm -hmm. And she was going to just fix me up because if I would look better, I'd feel better. And I, okay. and I, so I, I thought, you don't understand what's going on here. And I just felt sad. So I got down off the stage and I walked into the darkness again. Is this friend, if she had passed on? No. She was a living friend. Okay. Again, very few people see living people. I saw two. Uh, and then I had what that was is I had to take back a message to them. Okay. Interesting. About what gotcha. was going on in their lives. Right. Here comes the gardeners. Sorry about that. Oh, I can hear. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. It, do you want to stop and take uh, that out or you want to keep going? Let's keep going. Let's keep okay. going. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like hell. <laughs> um, so the first time I met a, a demon was is in the next time there was, I was, Boom, I was back someplace and it was dark, but there was this huge thing like Bigfoot on steroids, but it had kind of clothes on and, but it was, you had to look back to see the top of him and, and had a big, um, oh, like a stick thing. And, and I, I thought, you know, I just thought, ah, oh, you know what? And he says, do you want to get out of here? And I says, yes, I do. <laughs> and he says, well, um, you're not going to. You're going to have to despair. Oh. Just give up and despair. Uh, mm -hmm. And I says, well, no, no, I'm not going to do that. He says, well, if you do one thing that I ask you, I'll see that you get out. I said, sure. What is it? So he says, all you have to do is cut down. And then the scene opens up to this huge place, as far as you can see, blackberry vines. I don't know if you've ever seen them. They're very thick and they've got all kinds of horrible thorns on them. They have a lot of them around here. <clears throat> This field, if, if you cut down all those blackberry vines, mm -hmm. I'll see that you get out of here. Hmm. And I thought, uh-huh, yeah, <laughs> right. <clears throat> this guy is up to no good. 
So he hands me these kindergarten scissors that they used to cut paper. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, that's really mean that he knows I can't possibly do this, Mm -hmm. but I'm not going to, I'm not going to play his game. So I, I squatted down. Now I'm getting scratched and it hurts and I'm cutting this one vine. It was just so thick and I'm, I can hear him chuckling and and I'm just cutting this darn thing. I'm so mad Mm -hmm. and it, it cut. And so I went to put it behind me. When I turned back around, it grew back. Oh, wow. And he started really laughing then, kind of laughing. And I just thought, he says, give up. You're not getting out. And I I said, no. And I started cutting again. And boom, I found myself someplace else. Um, I just give the highlights. The the smaller things are in the book. But um, the next one was very bright. You know, I'd been in the dark for quite some time and it was very bright and it was like a hospital or something. It smelled like it. And there was white halls that went way down <clears throat> in a door on either side of me and all white. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, now what, you know? And then as I look straight ahead, there's another one of those demon things down there. Uh, big. Okay. And I thought, ah, you know, so I thought, <laughs> should I go to the right door or the left door? Mm-hmm. And when I turned back around, I don't, he was fast. I heard the stomp, 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 stomp. And it was right there. And he says, uh, you've got a, you've got a new job. And I said, oh yeah. And he says, yeah, you're going to go in that room over there and you're going to pick up what they give you. And you're going to take it across the hall to that room over there. And that's your job. And he lifts his stick up, like, you know, daring me to say something. I said, okay. He said, well, get gone. So I went into this room. And as far as it was a very big room with all these gurneys and they had women obviously laying on their backs with their legs laid open and draped, but everything has blood on it and stuff. And, Mm. and all you see is the back of all these people sitting on stools in front of these women's legs. And I thought, what is going on here? Mm. And, um, so that one of the doctors raises his hand like this and uh, then he turns around he says, get over here. So I went over and he had been doing an abortion. And so there was nothing left but this little torn up baby. And I was horrified. I was a pro-lifer on on earth. I belonged to a group that helped ladies in these situations Mm -hmm. find cribs and get food and all that stuff. So I was in shock and he just put this poor little torn up baby in my arms and says, get out. So I was in shock and I just went in the middle of the hall and looked at the demon and he points over to the other room. Mm-hmm. So I went over and I opened up, the door was open and I looked and as far as I can see this huge Costco warehouse sized place full of mounds of all these aborted babies. Oh, it just tore my heart out. I was just, I was sick, just sick. And I just put the little baby went down and I went in the hall and he says, okay, over there. And I says, no, I am not going to do that. I'm not going to do it. It's disgusting. Uh It's awful. And he says, oh, you have no idea what you're bringing on yourself now. And he raised his stick and I closed my eyes and boom. Uh So this went on and on in between. It was this darkened like wasteland with this road that was like dirt and, and stones that just went as far as you could see that way and far as you could see before it got too dark the other way nobody and I thought well at least I'm I'm fairly safe here you know I, until like maybe there's a door somewhere so I I didn't know which way to go I just picked away and started walking kind of looking behind you know and looking around and I would walk and walk and walk and I got tired and I, I was getting a little depressed and I didn't know what was going on and um, at, at one point I you know, there's no sense of humor there. That's the worst part about hell. And I said to myself, I think I'm on a treadmill, you know, because I'm walking and walking and I don't appear to be getting anywhere. Mm-hmm. But then up ahead, I smelled something good. And I thought, food, oh my gosh, food, wouldn't that be nice? And I got to this place where part of the scene was on one side of the road and part on the other side of the road. And there was a man sitting in a chair on the left side, kind of overseeing this woman on the right side. And there was tables just just piled with this beautiful food. You could just smell it. It was so beautifully laid out and all the 
china and silver and all that other. And this woman was working feverishly on all this food. And I went to talk to her and she turned around and, oh, she was another person, relative that I knew very well. Okay. And I said, oh, <clears throat> she was dressed funny. She had some sort of costume on and she was feverishly working. And um, I says, oh, I said her name. <clears throat> I'm, I'm so hungry. Could you just get me a little plate of something? And we were very close. And she says, no, this is for important people. Oh, okay. I thought, oh, okay. So I got back on the road and started walking. Um, the worst, almost worst <clears throat> thing, I guess, was when I was on the road, um, I could see figures kind of moving in, in the, in the, down the road there. And I thought, with what I've been running up against, this is probably not going to be a good situation. I kind of slowed my steps and tried to figure out what was going on. It seemed like a, <clears throat> a gathering or a village or something. There was, I don't know if you've ever seen Night of the Living Dead. It was like zombie people walking around. Their clothes were rags. Yeah. Skin was falling off. I mean, it was, they were gurring and growling and, mm -hmm. and shuffling. And <clears throat> I thought, Ugh, I got to get on the other side of this road. So I'll just keep my eyes down and then I'll kind of yeah. stagger through and see if maybe they don't notice me. <laughs> No, uh, they smelled fear. It's like all I can figure out later. I've had a lot of time to think about what was going on. Yeah. Um, so the women kind of with a skirt things, they, they kind of went out away from me. And I thought, good. But the men started circling me. And I thought, not good. And one pushed me. And then another one kicked me. And then they pushed me down and they all jumped on top of me and did terrible things. And um, so you can close your eyes and disappear on this one. I wish. <laughs> I did. Uh, no, I didn't. I, I, I didn't. I was there and this was all happening and it wouldn't stop. And then finally, uh, they backed up, uh, got a couple of kicks and this one horrible creature leaned over and was right, right in my face. I could smell his horrible breath and his skin was like falling off. And he says, we all have AIDS and now you have it mm -hmm. and you, you can't die. And I thought, uh, yeah, I was getting a little tired. I was, mm -hmm. I was, I was getting discouraged. Well, two years, is, well, in your, in your when you come back, you're thinking it felt like two years of going through yeah. these nightmares, <laughs> basically a, yeah. night, a nightmare. And so I'm, I'm curious, um, was this a, a literally hell? It, it, do you now believe in that there is a literal, literal hell that people can go to when they die? I have to finish the story. Okay, please do. <laughs> How I got out. Uh, Absolutely. It was, it was it was after that another situation occurred and I did manage to get out um, by singing a Christmas carol of all things because of oh. the situation. What's the Christmas and, carol in case you need it? <laughs> Everybody wants to know that. Uh, well, oh. I I was I was uh, I'm just curious. <laughs> well, no, it was away in a manger. <clears throat> oh, my favorite. Okay, and in other words, to that one. Good. My, well, <laughs> the thing was that the late there was there was a bunch of us ladies in this horrible shack and this horrible woman was telling us we had to wait for customers and um and i said you know i've been here a really long time and this seems like a particularly nasty uh feeling disposition uh, what's going on she says oh it's uh it's christmas on earth and it's always the worst day in hell oh, and bing, oh i thought hell because I really didn't know where I was. Wasn't and then I in. thought yeah. Christmas. And I thought I just started singing the song. And she's against the wall, other ladies in front of her. And she says, stop that. And I just away in a manger. And then the other lady started singing in a couple of the no crib for his bed. And then she's really shrieking the, the demon lady. And then we said the little Lord. And when she when I got to that part, she jumped. She was <laughs> jumped right at me. And I closed my eyes mm. and I opened them up and it was bright again, really bright. And my family was there. 
and I couldn't talk and I couldn't move and I didn't know what had happened. And all of a sudden my daughter says, oh, look, mom's back. And she came over and said, mom, you've been so sick. We thought we were gonna lose you. It's just a miracle you came back and we're so happy. And I thought, uh, what? I forgot the best part. I got so I get so wrapped up in that health thing and I just want to get out of there. <laughs> but when I did, before I came back, I did go to heaven. Okay. That yeah. Was, I'm thinking, wait, aren't we like, skipping a part? Of yes, a really important part of this important part. Story. Yeah, I did see the light and the light was, you know, it was very bright when I came back, of course, but it was very bright in heaven too. And that's when um, I didn't know where I was again, except that I felt swimming in love is the only thing I can come up with. Every molecule of me was just blissfully in love and happy and all that stuff. And I remembered nothing about the hell thing and really nothing about earth or who I was. I just was with God. I was home. I was in heaven and I felt wonderful. And I looked up and I saw a book on a big table and I, it was open, big book. And I thought, that's weird. And I looked back and there's my friend who just died the month before, my, my sweetheart. And Aww. I thought, oh my God. And then yeah. I thought, oh, he doesn't know he's dead. He looks so good and he looks so happy. And then he started laughing. And I thought, well, he heard what I said. And I thought, <laughs> oh my gosh, if, if he is dead, then I'm dead too. And I was so excited. I was just happy. I was so, I was just happy. And, and then I thought, well, why? And I thought, wait a minute. I remember him showing me something in that book. And I said, oh no, that's going to be too hard. I want to stay here with you. So I looked back at him and he said, Kat, Mary Kay is what he called me. You've got too much left to do. And I thought, oh, they're kicking me out. I don't believe it. And I said, mm. no. And that's when I woke up with a bright light in okay. the hospital. Well, my goodness, that seemed like a short stay. So now back on the other side, how long did yeah. that did that seem to last? The hell was about two years. This was what would you say? Five minutes. Oh, that's not fair. No, you got, you got it's ripped not. off. I, he was <laughs> laughing. He and I always played tricks on each other. And I would later when I was thinking about it, I thought of all the people to send me back, he'd go, I'll do it. I'll do it. <laughs> you know, oh, I'll my. get her good this time. So oh, I, 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 I see his picture. I said, I'm, I'm coming for you. <laughs> you know, we have a doctor. We have an end of this so yet. no one else. So only your friend you saw. And a yep. book that seemed to be maybe a book of your life or something. Probably. And okay. what was going to, what I was going to have to do when I came back. And, and that's, you didn't, you were not impressed. Cheating. <laughs> they won't, they won't let us know what it is. It's just cheating to know. But um, I had no idea. And here I am all these years later and so much has happened. And I mm -hmm. like, like we were talking earlier, it's just so wonderful to be on these podcasts and meet people from all over the world. And, and I never thought, a little girl in Gig Harbor, Washington, you know, that I came back, I couldn't move. I weighed 86 pounds, lost all my muscle mass. I couldn't talk. Um, I mm. thought, how am I going to get all this stuff done so I can go home if I can't even turn over in my bed? Right. So it's a little, uh, right. but now I see that it works. You know, we just show up and. How long were you in the coma? then three we almost three weeks so this three weeks uh for you was two years and five minutes <laughs> two years <laughs> yeah, and just five about ex and and just to it's so discombobulating to right. be in another dimension and not to mention two different places and then come back and then no nope, uh, thank god i couldn't talk because i was very uh ungrateful that they had a prayer uh, circle all over the world praying for me to come back and uh i later i was whenever they would say that i'd say you know i, I didn't want to come back i just wanted to stay in heaven why did you pray for me they, so months later right. i said to my mother mother if this ever happens again and i'm in a you know pull the plug do not make me come back she right. says honey don't worry we won't <laughs> okay know? oh my gosh okay yeah, i was such a pill about the whole thing yeah so it was hard being back and and nobody would listen to my 
my story. Mm -hmm. uh, they said, oh, it was the drugs. It was, uh, it was, the, you know, this, it was that it was a dream. And it's like, no, right. The doctor told me I could not possibly remember anything. Well, did it feel it, didn't want to like a dream. It. Did it feel fuzzy or did it feel no. real? It's in... still here. It's Pardon still me? here. What, what I still feel, I know every second of that now, whereas I can't remember a dream I had last night. It's not ah, a dream. Interesting. It happens in your soul. It doesn't happen. Some in people your brain. say when they cross over, um, it feels hyper real, more real than here. And then when we come back here, this is almost like a dream com in comparison. Mm, I, I'd argue. Well, I guess the, the trauma of being over there in a situation I didn't understand, and then the, the utter joy, it is. Mm -hmm more real because you're on high alert all the time here yeah, you true. get used to it you get used to it you know unless you have an earthquake or you know a yeah. plane crash or something like that i'm so, i'm very curious to hear your interpretation of hell your understanding of what is that now is that the biblical hell uh is it literal um what, what's i made it i believe that i would as a catholic I was taught from five on that there was heaven, purgatory, and hell. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. nobody right. went straight to heaven. Maybe Jesus did and probably Mother Teresa. <laughs> but everybody else had to go to purgatory and get your sins burned off. And then you were purified and you could go before God. Right. So um, I bought it. I, I lived it. Uh, there's a thing, you know, in the church about uh, indulgences, you know, you, you, right. you do something nasty, you get 200 days in purgatory. I mean, they, they wrote the sentence out right there in a book, you could read it. And then if you said a rosary, you got 300 days off purgatory. Yeah. So right. your whole life was this big math question. So right, when I got right. back, I thought, geez, I'm a bookkeeper and I screwed that up badly. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> no. So what I finally learned after all these years and being in touch with IONS, which is the International Association of Near-Death Studies, all those hundreds and hundreds of people and all their experiences and all the wisdom they brought back, I was able to just, I manifested that. I took horrible okay. things that happened to me in my lifetime and I made my own hell. Interesting. Um, and another part of that is Nancy Evans Bush, you're familiar with her Buddha and hell and other books. She's, she's kind of like one of the first ones. There was Howard Storm and a couple of them that did books on it, but she, she made a study of it. And what she came up with, with is that this is also something I signed up for, you know, when we we're up there and we decide to come down and what we're going to take on that I signed up for this, that um, she says that the, only the brave souls go into the dark places and bring out dark, bring light out of the darkness and bring those truths back and share them. And, and what I was sent back to say is you don't make your own hell. Uh, there is an all loving, all forgiving God. There is, I mean, atheist, everybody goes straight to heaven unless you choose not to, unless you believe differently. Mm -hmm. You believe it, you choose it, you're not disappointed, you get to go. But but it's like, let that go. Mm -hmm. It's not true. It's it's not true. Every, you're gonna go to heaven. Period. Exclamation point. So don't even think about it. So if you have a belief, it sounds like what I'm hearing is if one has a belief system that is based on, you know, you're good, you go to heaven, you're bad, you go to hell, you might just end up in a hell of your own creation after you die. But it also looks like, well, like with you, eventually you can get out of that creation, your mental manifestation. Um, and for you, it happened to be this song. And then when you said Jesus's name, for some reason, is that? I didn't even get to say it. You I didn't say thinking, it. No, I got right to that word. But somebody, a lot of, especially when they use air in the Bible belt, you know, they all the comments come in. If you just called on the name of yeah. the Lord, if you just said right. the name of Jesus, God is not in hell. God is not in hell. So there's no, I had no concept of God there. 
I, I was not able to do that because my consciousness said God is not in hell. Mm. And I didn't even think of God. I didn't think of my family. I didn't think of anything except that situation that was happening to me. Right. Um, you're better off not to go in the first place. Right. <laughs> uh, and you and you don't need to go. Um, I loved it when when I before I got this all figured out and I was scared to death of going back to hell every time I my temperature would spike or I'd get sick or something. I thought, oh, God, I'm going right. back to hell. Right. It took me a long time to let loose of that. I just let it go. And one time my sister, who was a born again Christian, just shortly after I recovered, she says, I don't know why you went to hell. She says, uh, I'm going, I'm going to die and, and go straight to Jesus's arms. And I says, you better have a plan B. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't need a plan B. And so, but now I understand. She, her faith is so strong. And that leads me to religion and spirituality. Mm. Um, I, I had to give up religion. I, I, uh, it's just religion has got too many man-made rules mm -hmm. that are meant to be exclusive rather mm -hmm. than inclusive. Mm -hmm. And that's not who God is. They are meant to make us fearful and right. that's not necessary. Right. Um, and I, I, I couldn't go anymore. I couldn't say the prayers. I, I, I mean, mm -hmm. my family is still Catholic. So when I, I go visit them, I'll go to church and I, I know God's there, but I know God's everywhere. I know God's in my heart. And I, I do that because I don't, I don't want to throw a bomb into anybody's uh, belief systems. If it works for them, great. If somebody's searching and they're not sure, I might have a couple ideas for you. But um, yeah, it, it changed everything for me and for the better. Oh, gosh, it's just so much nicer to hear all these stories and that people, um, you know, bring back. And like you say, there's this, this energy about it that um, is revitalizing and promising and, right. and upbeat. And, and now I think one of the biggest things for me was when I was hearing about, oh, no, we plan our own lives and all that. And it all makes sense to me. I, I, I choose to believe that. Um, and that I, that I chose everything that happened to me on this earth. And, and my daughter only was here for a short time because that's all she signed up for. She said, I'll, I'll go be with you for nine months, but then I'm going to meet you back up in heaven because I've, I've done this earth thing, you know, maybe one too many times. But mm. I wanted to learn the lesson. What is it like to feel totally devastated and, you know, love something that badly and have it taken away? Mm. What, what do I learn? What do I share with that experience? I had two other uh, girlfriends that lost babies within a couple of years after that. And they love to talk to me because I really knew how they felt. Yeah. There's this yeah. empathy that you get from suffering mm -hmm. that is not the same as sympathy. And that empathy is sure. valuable to other people who, who really need to feel understood and to share that. It's, um, I have so many questions swarming right now in my head, but one thing I was just pondering on it was the, the hell that you went through and it seemed so real at the time and how what a blessing really that now you realize okay wait a minute I created that I don't have to create that anymore I can share with other people to help them know they don't have to create that hell for themselves really dig deep within you are you fearful you know, of your God, or, you know, it, it, does your belief system include fear at all? Or is it freeing a love, an unconditional loving, freeing feeling, you know? Uh, yes, to both, because I'm still human. Um, I still have that little bit of me that says, yeah, but what if you're wrong? You know, because mm. I'm human and, and um, that's okay. I, I, uh, I, 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 I did ask God about that, you know, several, several years later, I was still saying, ah, I, you know, and I said, could you mm -hmm. just give me some, something short that I could just cling to if I could just do something positive? No, no, mm -hmm. thou shalt not. A couple of positive yeah. things to keep in mind so that I'll be sure to go that direction. So every morning I can kind of 
you know, affirmation or something. So it took a couple of months for it to come through, but it was very clear. It was the first part was be loving and kind. Mm. You know, what do I have to do to not go to hell again? Be loving and kind. And sure. then came merciful and forgiving, encouraging, grateful, non-judgmental, and useful. So every morning I got my picture of Jesus and I say, you know, help me to be these things. And so I'm always trying to keep it in my mind. And because I'm human, every now and then I'll blow up at somebody. I'll get mad because I took the cookies out on, uh, I made these cookies and I took them out of the oven. And they were on this parchment paper and they went flying like saucers all the way across the room. And I spent all this time making the cookies. I'd go peel them off the cabinets. I said a few choice words, uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but still, you know, I'm still human stuff still happens. Of and course. I have to say in the grand scheme of things, how important is a dozen cookies? You know, come on, let it go. Right. I do like not feeling like a victim in those situations uh, mm -hmm. where something happens. And I think I used to, before this happened, God, why are you doing this to me? I'm a good person. Why does this keep happening? Mm -hmm. Now I say, Kathy, what were you thinking? This is, this is pretty bad and pretty weird. What is the lesson here? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't blame anybody except myself, but it must be a good lesson. And I'm 75 now. So I've had time to see that this is true. No matter what happens, the synchronicities we were talking about earlier, all work for good. Mm -hmm. you know, they are, everything is all good. It's all going to work out exactly the way we planned it. It all lives happily ever after. And uh, you can kind of take a breath. So who is Jesus to you now if he is not? I know in the um, Catholic religion, Jesus is God in the flesh. And he's the savior that, well, you better believe in him. And if you don't, you're going to go to hell. <laughs> so who, <laughs> so who's a Jesus? little bit of a problem, a conundrum. <laughs> uh, this, I, been, I was wrestling with all this, but yeah. again, when you understand it, you know, if you really, I've been through the Bible, I mean, thousands of times, but, but he always, Jesus always said, uh, me and the father are one. We are brothers and sisters. Uh, you know, we, because we're all part of spirit. And in my mind, the way I, my little, brain for human human being human is Jesus is a big part of God and maybe I'm like a sliver you know oh, okay. but but we're all it all boils down to God we're all God and to me Jesus was somebody that he, he didn't really he was human and divine but so are you and so am I um we don't, he didn't know when he, he, when he crossed the veil, man, he had to play by the rules. He didn't remember who he was, you know, uh, we don't, we God. don't remember. I hear that all the time about, you know, yeah. the, the, the veil of forgetting and we don't know about all of our lives or what's on the other no. side. And of course, and so we're fascinated with that, or a lot of us are fascinated with that wanting to remember. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I, I see Jesus as the person who came down you know, God's always sending somebody to remind us, mm. be loving and kind. Was that what he taught? Love God above all things and your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. I mean, all the, the great prophets, and I'm not lumping him in that sum because I think he's a bigger prophet, but it's, it's semantics, you know. Mm -hmm. um, he taught us how to live. He taught me how to live. He taught me how to have faith and to how to die trusting in God that it would all work out. And all right. I got to do is be loving and kind, merciful, forgiving, all those things that, so he, he's my idol as is the wrong word, but I mean, he's my ideal. He's my right. ideal. Yes. That's the best human humanity can get. And yeah, he lost his temper and, and because he was human, you know, right, when, right. we've got this dichotomy thing going on. I, gosh, I'm really um, have enjoyed this conversation. I don't want it to end, but we are getting a little bit running out on time. Can you tell me what is the name of your book? And of course, I'm going to put links to that in the video section and how uh, listeners can connect with you. It's called Misfit in Hell, because I kept trying to get out, to Heaven <laughs> Expat. And an expat or expatriate is someone that lives in one country and they go and do their work in another country. And then when they finish their work, they go back home. And we all start in heaven 
we come down here, we do our work, hmm. we go home. So that's the Heaven X pet part. And it's on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and all that okay. stuff. And it's, it's not just about the hell experience, it's about the whole life I've had and my ancestors and how I came to be who I was and what I believe, mm -hmm. then the experience and that what, how it had changed me mm -hmm. and what I have learned over the years and the message that I was meant to bring. And there's a lot of humor in it. It's not just some, you know, horrible thing you don't want to read just before you go to bed. It's, it's very uplifting. And, and uh, so you have, beautiful. you have developed some opinions now about, um, reincarnation and past lives some people would be very curious to know do i have to come back to earth are there other <laughs> planets one question <laughs> yes. are, do, are there other planets i can you know incarnate on can i just hang out in the afterlife wherever ever that is indefinitely <laughs> you know some people go to different parts of heaven and and learn different things and so many of them have said that's that's how it works i didn't have that experience but it makes sense to me i could never mm -hmm. understand why there were so many people on the planet and if there was no reincarnation wasn't that a waste i mean that heaven is going to be so crowded you'll never find somebody but when you think of god being the first uh uh person to uh recycle you know to recycle the souls and send them back down and it it just makes sense uh i bought it and I don't know if I want to come back or not, but they say on the other side, you look at things differently. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm going to waive my, uh, my final decision. Right. <laughs> this is a tough, I've heard that this is the toughest place to go. That earth is the toughest place. I've heard and that, that you, too. Yeah. You get like a little badge on your soul or something. So people <laughs> walk by and say, Oh man, you went to earth. That's cool. Um, yeah. So I buy that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe take a break. Maybe we take a break for a while and incarnate on easier places, and then we have forget. We kind of forget yeah. what it was like. That's why I, you know, I hear a lot of women, including myself. You know, you you get pregnant and you go through the childbirth and you say, "Oh, never, never again. again," and then you forget <laughs> it and you're like, "Oh, I'm gonna do that again." But there was a time you were like, "No, no, I'm never gonna do that again." <laughs> that's exactly. Uh, that's the best uh, metaphor, I think right there yeah we forget <laughs> but that's all right i want to go flying uh, you know and go i want to see what's in the black hole i want to see the rest of the universe I, i've got a lot of stuff i want to do but there is no time there see so you just do it yeah, i've heard that that's such a, a a hard thing to wrap my head around like what yeah, that it would is. be like just oh, you're just in the present yeah all the time wow. just now very interesting this is so fascinating and before we sign off any other last words you've shared already so much um very helpful pieces of advice so i appreciate that yeah just just you don't need to go to hell i don't care what you've been taught um give yourself a break it's look into it it's, it's uh, you don't need to go thank you yay i don't want to <laughs> i don't plan no, to <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you so much, Kathy, for, for you, taking Julie. time to share your yeah. amazing story. Um, and thank you to everyone for watching. This has been Julie McVeigh with Unordinary Made Ordinary. And I hope you'll join us next time for another fascinating interview. If you did enjoy this, please give it a thumbs up. And um, of course, subscribe if you like this type of content and hit the bell icon for YouTube to be alerted to future videos. And I do hope you're having a fantastic day or evening wherever you are on the planet or off the planet. And <laughs> we'll see y'all next time. Bye. Bye-bye.